Good morning. Welcome to Friday Coffee Meetup. I am your host, Christy Connor. We are very pleased to have you here with us this morning. Surprised at the little bit of rain outside, but we are so happy to have you here um, to be part of our community. Friday Coffee Meetup is the largest active innovation tech entrepreneurship meetup in Los Angeles, California. We have about 7,000 members. Traditionally, we meet in person, um, but due to the COVID-19 crisis, we are virtual, but we are looking forward to hopefully seeing your faces soon. I do miss seeing everyone and hope that you're staying safe and well. I have put a little bit of information into the chat window. We have information around Friday Coffee Meetup. We do have a YouTube channel and a podcast channel, so please check those out. We've had many great speakers over the last many years, um, and those are all archived there, so enjoy. I've also put in information. We will be handling the question and answer session via the Q&A panel, not via the chat window. The chat window is currently unmoderated, so be very polite there. <laughs> um, but put your questions into the Q&A panel. We will be having questions and answers with Chris at the end of the session. So put your information there and we will ask them at the end. Please be as succinct as possible in your question. It will help me in aggregating them and reading them out. And we hope to get to all questions, but please don't take offense if we don't get to every question, we will do our best. We also have some information in there about after meeting networking. So we will be having open meeting at open networking after we complete the Q&A today. So if you would like to stay for that, please stay on the line and we will move you over into the panelists area um, to participate in that open networking at the end. And then if you do have jobs that you're hiring for, we are all about jobs and getting people hired. So if you have any jobs that you're hiring for, please put them into the chat window. I know that Jan has also just reposted a chat uh, the chat information from earlier. And then there's some more information about Chris Bayer as well um, and Motive Space Systems in that chat window. So with that, I am so excited to introduce to you Chris Bayer um, of Motive Space Systems. He's going to talk to us about moving the decimal point for new space. Space exploration is a very costly business, and he's going to talk to us about navigating NASA contracts, as well as commercializing advanced space robotics. The company's work includes um, robotic systems for NASA JPL's Mars 2020 mission, and as well has recently launched an X-Link space-rated modular robotic arm system. With that, I'm very pleased to open it up to Chris Thayer. Welcome, Chris. Hey there, thank you. Share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, Thanks for the introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, new or commercial space uh, is an area where you see bold ideas that sometimes have never been tried before. And these ideas can come with risks to both the investor side and also the employees and people who put in a lot of uh, sweat equity into the, uh, into the visions and the dreams of, of those companies. And often using methods or uh, products from the past, um, these ideas can't be realized. But if we can find new ideas or uh, perhaps new approaches, some of these visions can be realized. We set out to make a company that uh, can enable these new space ideas, if you will, um, from things like in-space manufacturing, where we build structures that you know, were unthinkable in the past in terms of scale or scope. Um, to servicing, repairing some assets that may already be up there that, that it's difficult to, you know, to, to replace those. Um, all the way to protecting current assets uh, susceptible to orbital debris or, or things like that. Um, and then obviously utilizing space resources for sustained human presence or, or any of those kind of activities and just general space exploration, uh, which I think everyone's pretty familiar with uh, on that concept. 
So I'm Chris Thayer. I'm, as, as uh, was already stated, I'm, I'm president, CEO, and a co-founder of uh, Motive Space Systems. Um, we always kind of looked at ourselves like a pickaxe and shovel company, if you will, uh, from the, the gold rush days, um, kind of enabling all these new missions with advanced robotics. Uh, I have a background in technical and organizational leadership and space flight robotics. Um, I've also, you know, dabbled in race cars and underwater robotics and a number of different, uh, you know, aircraft um, applications. And uh, I'd like to share with you a little bit about who we are, uh, what we're doing and, and where we see um, robotics going um, in the future. So a bit about Motive Space Systems. Uh, we founded Motive Space Systems uh, back in 2014 <clears throat> with a vision for doing some uh, innovative things in both the space side and also in ground robotics, which you know is, may not be obvious in, the, in, our, in our company name. Um, we saw some gaps in the market and we thought we could fill those, those gaps with uh, some of our, our knowledge and expertise. And the image that you see here is uh, JPL's 2020 Mars Rover Perseverance. Uh, for which we're providing a number of, of critical hardware elements. Um, this is really a, a great example for us of, of a collaborative project uh, with NASA where we thought we could really add some, add some value. So when we first set out, we knew we had to build a great team because nothing happens without, uh, without a great team on board. Um, our first step in building that team um, was finding people with a breadth of experience encompassing most of the major robotics developments in the space sector over the past 20 years. From things like the Mars rovers of Spirit and Opportunity, um, the Curiosity lander, to landers of uh, Phoenix and Insight, um, but servicing missions from both DARPA and Goddard, um, and all sorts of advanced ground robots like Valkyrie and Robonaut um, and Robosimian, um, we assembled a team with kind of a deep, deep uh, experience and also a vision for what, what, where we wanted to go. But of course, you know, building the team is never over. It's not like we finished <laughs> on the first day. So we keep adding uh, talent to the pool, both in breadth and depth um, to try to, you know, augment and, and keep growing as, as things change. Let's see. Um, so this is kind of interesting. We had a, a very specific approach to how we wanted to build uh, the company out. Um, one of those things was, was this building block approach. And, um, you know, being a small business, you have to make sure that every step you take is kind of an affirmative step, one that you want to take and one that builds towards the future. Uh, and that's kind of like amassing Legos um, into, you know, assemble new capabilities and new things uh, and, and, and new, new products. So we try to ensure that if we go and compete for a program or we're um, developing a new product, it's leveraging both our core competencies and uh, it also leads to a vision. Um, so they're not kind of terminal or dead end um, roads. Um, we use our IRAD, um, Internal Research and Development Funding uh, for key development efforts. We use SBIR funding, so Small Business Innovative Research. Um, we try to leverage those um, funding sources from the government, uh, but we do so in a way that builds products we need for our portfolio. Um, and that, that's proven to be very, uh, very valuable. Um, and we also use technology licensing um, from places like Caltech or, um, you know, NASA. Um, and those can be a springboard for growth areas uh, as well. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's, that's, that's been a great, a great path for us in terms of uh, building out capability. These are just some of the, uh, some examples of some recent uh, flight deliverable projects that we've done that have kind of made a, an impact um, on, on us. Um, so you've got the uh, Mars 2020 uh, rover. Uh, we did the robotic arm for that, obviously. Uh, it's up in the upper left-hand corner there. Um, this was actually a, a pretty significant challenge. Uh, we had to increase the payload capacity from the Curiosity rover, which uh, most people know is, is up on Mars right now. Uh, we had to increase that payload capacity by 50% without significant relief in terms of mass or size of the robotic system. So we had to really um, stretch. Um, we had to make 
much more capable actuation systems. We had forest torque sensing, a number of different things. Um, and that was a real, real challenge, but uh, the team got a lot of, a lot of uh, satisfaction out of, out of doing that. Um, additionally, you know, that, that forest torque sensor is the first one that's gonna, that it's gonna go up. And for roboticists, they understand that means you can basically tell what the arm is touching. Um, without a force torque sensor um, or without force sensing in an arm, you really can't tell if you're making uh, contact with the ground or what kind of loads are being imparted into the system. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge enabling um, thing. It's small, but it's a huge, a huge thing. Um, mass cam Z on the lower left hand corner. Um, that's also going up on the 2020 rover and you'll see that on the mast, if you will, of the, uh, of the rover. Um, and uh, we, that'll be the first ever stereoscopic zoom capability on another planet. So that'll be great to see that coming back. And we did that with the uh, and Space Science Systems. Um, the cryogenic filter wheel in the center, which admittedly is not uh, an obvious robotics fit, uh, is an application which we employed kind of a novel approach to control um, for thermal and power management, which actually translated into uh, the robotic side as well. So sometimes it's about, you know, exploring these different paths and then, and then re-infusing um, what you learn in those paths into other products. And, and that's something we certainly have done on, on, the, on this example, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later in terms of other things we've done. And on the right is uh, the Restore L satellite servicing program at Goddard for which we've been uh, developing kind of next generation uh, state-of-the-art uh, drive electronics for, which will really enable uh, a, a number of different uh, elements for that for that mission. So, all kind of very exciting things, and they all feed into each other. In terms of our SBAR strategy, uh, this is another good um, story, I think, um, where we we set out to have a SBAR um, for the uh, icy worlds. So, the icy icy moons. Uh, around uh, Jupiter and Saturn, um, they are very, very cold uh, and there's not a lot of power there. So it's helpful if you can have electronics that can operate at very cold temperatures. Uh, in this case, we set out to make a, a, a motor controller that could operate at minus 185C. And we succeeded in that SBIR, but we were always mindful that for a lot of customers, a lot of uh, people that are doing space and or, you know, orbital um, missions, uh, they don't need that capability. So we tried to make sure that we had um, parts and uh, design that was flexible so that it didn't have to have all those, uh, the same components that, needed to, that it needed for operating down at minus 185. Um, so we did that and we actually created a product out of that. Uh, then that was commercialized and it's been deployed many times um, on several, um, several, um, several missions and applications. And, and I think that will continue to go on. Um, and we've done this in other areas, but this is a really uh, great um, example of, of that. So that, then the other side is another example that we do, we do internal product development where we just have a, a good idea, we think, and then we start uh, slowly funding that to see if the idea proves out. And then we kind of go and, and really develop that as a flight product. Uh, this is an, an example of a small motor controller that we then deployed on four, that's on four missions now. Um, and that was a, just kind of a, a, an idea that someone had in, in the building and we just thought it was a good one and, and kept funding it. Um, so let's see here, there's the block. Whoa, sorry, technical difficulties. Um, but then we, we also kind of from very early on, um, we thought um, there was something to bringing the flight experience we had uh, in, you know, in our flight robotic systems into the ground robot as well. Um, what you see here is our RoboMantis robot, which is a modular reconfigurable robot um, and uh, kind of it suits a broad number of, of applications for uh, use here on Earth. Um, and while it's great for the ground system stuff and, and it's kind of a, it's a cool robot, uh, I think, um, it actually turned out to be important on the space side and uh, we'll talk about that uh, in a second. 
So let's see here. Um, with that, you know, we have kind of end-to-end -end solutions for robotics for a variety of applications and are actively working um, efforts, you know, for the moon, uh, Mars, uh, and things like the icy worlds I mentioned, comet applications, um, servicing construction, and then just generically, uh, you know, human, uh, human missions and human exploration. Um, but again, as we build those building blocks up, we've been able to leverage those chunks all the time as we do them, we say, well, we're going to reuse this later. We're going to reuse this design later. Let's make sure we have flexibility to do that. And that lowers the, the NRE and uh, reduced schedule for those things uh, going forward. And whether that's a, um, whether that's a, a commercial or a government mission, um, saving money is usually uh, uh, well received. So that's something we try to do and, and it also reduces schedule and risk to those missions as well. So the, uh, you know, bespoke uh, one of one-off robotic systems like the one you see here. That is the robotic arm being installed on the um, on the Perseverance rover. Um, those always have a place in these science applications, um, and uh, you know we're obviously very proud to keep doing them and 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 running with that. Um, but to enable the uh, the broader ecosystem envisioned for the, the space economy, we have to adapt to a new way of doing things as well. That's more accessible and more productized. Um, and now we can offer both of those, those paths going forward. So here, here we have our kind of our a nice little uh, story of our custom space robotics um, encapsulated in that picture, uh, whether that's drive electronics or sensing or perception or whatever. Um, and then we also have our ground robotics products. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, we, we initially thought, well, let's bring our, our uh, flight robotics into the ground robotics side. Um, and then at some point we realized, well, actually, what if we reverse that flow and started taking the lessons we're learning on the ground robotics side and flow that back into the flight systems? And what could that do? Could that change, could that change things? So we really wanted to build a system that could be a kind of a ubiquitous robotics presence, enable that um, in orbit. Um, but to do that, you have to bring the cost down. You have to make things easy. So we wanted to build a, a modular reconfigurable system, which we had on the ground side, um, adaptable architecture, um, really to be able to suit a number of a broad number of missions, kind of that 80-20 rule. Uh, we wanted to build a system that really could encapsulate uh, a vast majority of the, the missions that were out there. And uh, obviously uh, cost is a big deal. So if you have startups that are trying to, they've got that dream, they want to go out, they want to, um, they want to, uh, you know, get rid of orbital debris or they want to be a space tug or they want to do a number of different things, uh, build, build things on orbit. Um, it, it usually can't be at um, those kind of flagship uh, NASA level budgets. Um, so you have to make it uh, less expensive, easier to integrate. Um, the delivery times uh, need to be brought way down. Um, and also we need to, um, this is something that's not obvious if you're not inside you know, the game, um, the accommodations for the spacecraft, you need to make sure that you have a minimal footprint so you don't have to change um, your spacecraft. Um, because you're putting a robotic arm on there. We try to think of, we want, um, a lot of times right now, you say, I have got a robotic mission or a robot mission. Um, what you want to have is just missions that have robots, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so it's not the mission's purpose. It's just another thing, another tool that's there uh, for use everywhere. So that brings us to, uh, to X-Link. Um, X-Link is Motive's modular robotic manipulation system uh, for space. Um, here you see an example of X-Link grappling a small satellite and preparing to berth it to its host spacecraft. And this is a, a good example of, of kind of what we, what we can do and what we hope to do with um, the X-Link product. So you, you may notice that this looks very similar to 
um, our ground robots, um, and that's you know that's intentional, like RoboMantis. Um, and so we have a design here that's uh, it's a modular system, so we can actually reconfigure that into multiple different uh, instantiations, um, and uh, all the control electronics are embedded in the arm itself, um, and. So the, the attributes of modularity, scalability, flexibility, um, allow the system to be affordably deployed in everything from a research lab uh, all the way through um, various um, Earth orbits uh, to the moon and even to Mars. Um, so we can really take this system um, and at those various price points uh, for, for researchers all the way through to um, long duration life, um, in space, um, we can actually meet you those needs. So that's a that's kind of a game changer, and obviously trying to reduce that cost so everyone can everyone can participate. And really, that's the goal is to enable um, enable everyone to be able to put uh, robots where they need them uh, in space. Here you see just a, a quick graphic showing. Um, three example configurations uh, of X-Link ranging from one to three meters in length. Um, all of these are basically, the way that you look at these right now, they're, they're actually testable in Earth's gravity, which is a huge advantage, um, especially when you talk about, you know, two and three meter lengths uh, for arms. That's a, a game changer as well. Um, a lot of arms that you'll see in space currently, um, those things are were not testable on Earth without offloading or support. Um, so that's something that really um, allows you to do rapid um, integration and test and validate uh, what you're doing in your operations. Um, and, and that's something that uh, we think is uh, also helps with the speed, uh, speed to market. Um, we again, we kind of assemble these things like they're Lego pieces, um, including the what's not shown here, but including perception systems, the computation control systems, um, and we can really configure and tailor uh, tailor this to a, a user's specific needs. So our first our first scheduled launch of Xlink um, is actually scheduled to happen on Arcanaut One. Um, and this is a, a mission led by Maiden Space where they're doing a 3D printed large solar array boom. Uh, and these new solar arrays promise to yield significantly more power, 5X what is currently capable on a, on a, on a spacecraft of that size. Um, on our arm, we'll be positioning various uh, printing um, components and both the printer and, and printed components um, up there. So uh, that, that will be a, a really, Kind of a revolutionary um, demonstration of um, auto manufacturing and, and robotics as well. So to, to wrap things up, um, I wanted to give a, a plug for our uh, for achievement that both our team and thousands of people around the you know the LA basin have worked on tirelessly for years now, uh, the Perseverance rover. Uh, for Mars 2020, which is launch launching in just a few weeks. Um, and uh, we're obviously super excited about that. Um, but with the theme of, of enabling, um, the robotic arm we designed um, and built will uh, enable a search for microbial life as well as being the first link in the chain of bringing samples of Mars back to Earth um, through its coring and sample collection system. So that's that's obviously very exciting, and, and we we obviously hope to be involved in, in that uh, that that process in the future for those missions as well. Um, so in, in conclusion, I just want to thank you all for listening to what Motive's up to, and uh, a bit of what I see as the future of space robotics. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. This is fascinating. Um, I had a quick question before we launch into Q and A. So on the solar panels, are they did you say they're being printed and assembled in space? Uh, so the, the actual uh, photovoltaic cells are rolled up on a roll. Uh, and there's okay. the boom is the structural part that's being printed out. And that will just, that will extend the roll out. That way, typical solar arrays are structurally rigid panels that get folded up. Um, and that's why it's limiting for a small spacecraft. You can't fit large solar arrays on, on the spacecraft like that. So this is a relatively innovative 
uh, well, it's a very innovative way of, of, of deploying a, uh, um, a solar array. Okay, fantastic. Um, our first question, how different are X-Link and ground robotics? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and that was one of the first things that, you know, in, in that aha moment where we started looking at this, we said, well, wait a second. We looked at that and we said, wait, that's exactly what we need. What, what do we need to change to make that flight worthy? And so uh, at the end of the day, obviously there are a number of things that are, are constrain you uh, in, in space. Um, in terms of both uh, computation and then materials and processing. Um, but if you were to tear most of these things apart, they look very, fairly similar. Um, and that's a bit of a cheat on our side because we come from building space stuff. So then when we build ground stuff, it looks similar to our space stuff. So, um, but uh, primarily you're talking about different materials, sometimes different sensing um, that you have to put in the um, in the actuators, um, and then obviously uh, from a software and uh, com computer side, uh, that's where things get real dicey because you don't have the same computational power that everyone's desktop has right now. Um, it's hard to replicate that uh, on orbit in an affordable manner. Um, so that's where things, uh, things get, uh, get more complicated and you have to be very efficient in those areas. On the space customizable robotics, what are the services those robotics normally provide and who are your main targets for that? So um, on, on the, so on, on the X-Link uh, product line, um, we're really the, um, the initial customer base that we're targeting is, is more of a new space um, uh, uh, audience. Um, most of the NASA missions are fairly, um, they're fairly bespoke or boutique kind of solutions for very specific cases. Um, and a lot of times when we're talking to new customers that are trying to um, go out and, and build a business case for a, um, for a mission or for a, a service that they're going to provide, um, they need flexibility. Um, all the way through the development process because they're still working out typically what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. So as they build that uh, use case up, um, we need flexibility in the system, which typically doesn't happen on something like a, a government syst uh, procurement system, which it takes years to get there. And by the time you see it, it's very well thought out and very well documented but that flexibility is needed on, on the new space side. And that's, that's primarily the target now, but we are talking with certain government agencies as well um, to deploy this system um, on some of their, let's say, innovative uh, platforms. And how do you decide which technologies to license that you're gonna go with? Talk a little uh, bit about that. Yes, yeah, so that's actually really interesting. I think one of the lessons that, uh, I had learned over the years, and especially uh, uh, here, um, really you have to have um, almost someone who was embedded in the technology at some point in their career to actually be able to transition it from uh, a, a, either an academic or, or government institution. Um, it's very difficult to just take a cold piece of technology and then integrate it. Um, so, We've done that with a number of different uh, products where um, we were familiar with them in our either in our past life um, or uh, familiar with the people. And so we had an easier path to transition uh, that technology because usually it doesn't come with a bow on top of it already to unwrap and use. Uh, you have to do some digging and you have to invest a significant amount of time and effort into it. So you have to know that there's value there. Um, and you can't just go, oh, that looks neat. I'm sure I can use that somehow. You have to really have an understanding. Otherwise you can waste a significant amount of time. Uh, but like I said, with our building block approach, we like to make sure that when we see something that we want to integrate, it has not only use for today, but use for tomorrow and how we would build that into a product line or really augment a whole suite of products. And in that product process, you know, to, to fund that, what, how did you finance your company's launch? So we actually um, were internally funded and uh, we, uh, we didn't take any uh, 
any external uh, like VC money or angel money. Um, and uh, so that's, that was, we were very fortunate to be able to, to do that. Um, and we were profitable from the first month we were in business. So um, that was a, that was a, it's a unique situation. I'm, <laughs> I'm fully aware of that, uh, but we've been pretty, pretty happy with our ability to do that. That's fantastic. Some of the robots you showed at the beginning of the talk had very humanoid forms. Um, could you be able to elaborate on your thoughts on form and function? Uh, let's see. So, yes, yeah, so some of the things that you were seeing were um, from people that worked at Johnson Space Center, um, and that included uh, Robonaut and Valkyrie, um, two humanoid uh, um, form factor robots. Um, that those are um, obviously very interesting, primarily because if you're going to do things in a human environment, that environment's designed for shocker humans. And so, um, so if if you can develop a robot that can interact with the world uh, much the way the same that a human does, then that's advantageous. Um, the problem being is humans are really um, amazing, uh, honestly, in terms of, of both locomotion and uh, dexterity and, and how they how they interact with the world. Um, so it's still still a big challenge to make uh, a robot that um, that can mimic the, you know, the nuances of a human form factor. Um, so you see more things that are more direct, um, like a rover, like you see on the screen now. Um, that's obviously um, a very purpose-built robot and it's built more like a robot for doing robot tasks. So I think there's still ongoing research and that's an exciting area for sure. Um, but for a while, uh, we're still gonna see a lot of the robots that uh, we, we uh, depend on to do tasks look more like um, a, a classical robot would look. Um, and, and, and eventually I think that uh, the humanoid um, factor will all, humanoid form factor in the robots will also uh, catch up. The biggest issue with that is, is power. Um, a wheeled robot is, is much more power efficient um, than, than a walking robot um, currently. Um, and so that's really something that is difficult um, to, to change that, um, so. And next we have a technical is question, how do you compensate for angular momentum when manipulating an arm in space? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that's, that's, that, so there are, there's a number of different ways, but typically uh, you have reaction wheels on the spacecraft that, uh, that counteract those, uh, uh, those motions of the, of the robotic arm. But it's a dance that you have to be very careful with, especially on something like a small spacecraft um, where the robotic arm and its momentum can actually be a, a significant percentage of that of the, the host spacecraft, if you will. Um, so you have to control your rates and exactly what you're doing and when you're moving and how you're moving um, as so you don't saturate your reaction wheels. Um, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a real issue that you have to kind of uh, really take care of um, and mind that. You, you can kind of think of um, momentum as a, as a resource um, on orbit, um, and you have to you have to mind that carefully. So, okay. And in the beginning of the presentation, you talked about some solutions for space debris removal. Can you talk a little bit about that part of your work? Uh, so, there's a, a, there's a myriad of different debris that's especially in, in, in low Earth orbit, um, and it's becoming an ever greater problem. Um, now we don't do um, space debris removal per se, uh, but what you, one of the things that um, you have to look at is how do you get um, large, um, you know, spent second stages uh, that are floating around. Um, there's everything from paint chips floating around at you know thousands of miles an hour all the way to large, um, you know, very large multimeter sized uh, chunks that are floating around up there. Um, and this is this constant um, debris issue is something that's very active in, in not only um, the U.S. kind of uh, community, but also globally. Um, and there are a number of companies that are going after this to do debris removal. One of the challenges with that is that 
as an example, if the Russians launch a spacecraft and they have a second stage that that they uh, that's sitting up there, that's still considered Russian property. So you cannot go as a U.S. company and go grab that and throw it away. Um, that's a, a treaty violation. So those are there, there's there's a lot of complexity that goes beyond just the complexity of going up and grabbing something and disposing of it. There's also the complexity of international treaty law that goes along with that. So there are a number of people uh, looking at that, but it's still a very fledgling um, activity. And, and to date, no one's really um, actively, um, you know, cleaning up the the orbits as we speak. So that's something that will. I, I believe it will have to happen at some point. Um, how it happens and who pays for it, that's a different question. Okay. And that treaty law, is there, I'm assuming there are groups looking at that and how that's gonna evolve as, as we go forward? Yeah, there, there, there are definitely people looking at that, but I don't know, um, I don't know how much uh, activity there are, you know, act, activity there is on, on changing any of that uh, as we speak. Um, but but there are definitely passionate people um, um, trying to move the needle on that for sure. Okay. And is your X Link arm a candidate for a payload on an upcoming NASA commercial lunar landing missions, robotic or human lander? Um, so that that one is is we're actually trying to look at uh, some of those clips missions um, going forward, and and we're hopeful we we have a. a candidate for that. Um, outside of that, uh, one of our other products is, is going to be um, on, a, on a lunar eclipse mission too for a robotic arm that uh, we're developing um, that we'll be announcing soon. So, um, so we'll also be uh, hopefully going to the moon uh, here shortly um, for, with a robotics system that's uh, going to be very unique. But I can't say more than that right now, but it should be, should be great. Okay. And then how do you design um, electronics for different, different application areas like Earth orbit, Moon, and Mars, speaking of the Moon? Right, so that's, a, that's, a, that's obviously very interesting. One of the things that we try to do, um, because again, you have to do a lot of validation work on the ground before you're either in orbit or on Mars or on the Moon. And so um, to do that, um, people generally, because flight electronics and flight hardware just in general is so expensive, they end up using um, they end up using hardware that's not the same in early testing. So what we tried to do was make sure we had a design that actually we had everything from commercial grade um, hardware all the way through uh, flagship, you know, class A um, mission hardware that was the same. So you were always testing on the same type of system, the same system essentially. So as you build up from your lab all the way through to flight, all that work is relevant. Um, you're never really breaking the chain of that hardware or that, or, or that system um, as you go through that process. Um, the big thing is obviously, you know, the killers are for electronics, you've got your radiation environment, um, which, which goes everything from fairly benign um, environments in certain LEO applications um, all the way to basically, you know, um, almost impossible out in the Jovian um, um, uh, moons out there. So, so you've got this range of, of, of radiation as a, as a huge issue. And then you've got all, also the temperature uh, fluctuations. And sometimes everyone wants to focus on the cold part of it. That's a real thing. But sometimes when we're, we're using arms or we're using electronics, actually getting heat out of them is, is hard too. So, um, that's really the hard part. Um, and then there's mission duration. So a lot of the missions, uh, CubeSats and the like, um, they can use you know, fairly low grade commercial parts because they only have to last for a few days or a few weeks. But if you wanna last for 15 years in a radiation um, environment, um, you have to basically buy very expensive parts that uh, can work in that, that have been screened and you can have confidence in. So it really, it's really quite a challenge to, um, to, to, to build an electronics package that can be affordable at all those different areas, be the same essentially in all those areas, um, but, but uh, um, is adaptable enough to be able to be housed and, and utilized um, in all those areas as well. Great. 
And then can you talk a little bit more about testing your products to qualify and certify them for space environments? What capabilities do you have to have? What does that look like? Sure. Um, so a lot of times just the, the simple infrastructure things, you need to have a bunch of processes in place. Um, you need to have um, equipment, clean rooms, um, uh, things like of that nature. And then as you go through the process, different things require different um, testing services, but you go through thermal testing, you go through maybe thermal vacuum testing where you're putting it into a system, into um, an environment that's similar to what you would find um, in space, uh, all the way to if you really have a, a particular case that, that needs it, you can have a sun simulator on one side and, and a cold bank on the other side to see what that thermal gradient is in a thermal vacuum um, situation. And then you do maybe some uh, static testing where you put loads on things to test their structural capacity. And then all the way through uh, vibration testing where you shake it. Um, the old adage is you don't build spacecraft, you build uh, launch craft because you build the, the spacecraft to really survive the loads that are imparted during the launch. It's not so much space. Once you're in space, the loads actually drop quite a bit. Um, so you test all of those things and it's a test as you fly, fly as you test mantra. So you go through this process of, you know, you test it as it's going to see its environments and then you, you fly it just like you tested it. Um, and then that gives you confidence that, that the system will work. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about government, what the government private relationship looks like and where you think it will go in the future, as well as kind of those implications around ownership, how resources are used, and then any things that you learn or discover. Mm, that's a lot. That's you may have to remind me. Well, let's to, start with but... let's start with government. <laughs> like, can you discuss the kind of government relationship versus the private relationship? Can you talk about what? You, what you think it might be evolving to in the future how between how it looks now yeah i think uh, over the past you know decade or two you've seen a um a definite uh, bent towards having um a what they call a public private partnership in a lot of these um, um contracting models you see that even today with the artemis um, hls system that uh, to get back to the middle where there's a public private partnership um, and most notably, you saw that in the launch the other day of two astronauts to the ISS on the SpaceX um, uh, launch vehicle. So there's there's definitely a much uh, tighter integration um, between NASA or the DOD and private companies, um, and I think that will only grow because um, there's there's significant value there uh, for both parties um, if leveraged properly. I think that's a that's a great thing. Um, and I also see, I see that people in the government, that another shift that's happened is more of a desire to buy products. Um, so as they have a, a need or a, a mission or something, they have, have, whereas maybe 30 years ago it would have been, let's, let's start from scratch in a clean sheet of paper to now it's what's out there, what can the commercial sector give us today and and how do we how do we adapt that for our use, uh, which is a, which is a pretty seismic shift I think, um, and I, and and that makes it more in line with how you um, interact with uh, a commercial company. So it's it's those things are becoming more similar rather than more dissimilar. Okay, and then you know as you're working together, the implications around ownership, how resources are used, and then you know intellectual property, things that are learned or discovered going forward. Sure. Honestly, the government's great about intellectual property, and especially if you're a small business, they want to foster as much ownership of, of the IP that you're generating as possible so you can be successful, leverage that, commercialize that. And so that's, I say that one of the, and I might get pilloried for this, but uh, one of the best uh, investors you'll find is the U.S. government. Um, they are, they they have belief in you and they want you to succeed, and and they're they um, they're they're a great partner for for uh, growing growing your business. Um, and if you play that 
you know, play that nicely and, and, and complement that with, with, uh, with industrial work and, and working with private companies, um, you can really foster some, um, some pretty powerful things. So. Okay, great. Um, we had a lot of questions today, but I'm going to wrap up with one looking towards the future. Are there any advancements in emerging tech that will enable space robotics or travel in new ways that you're looking forward to? Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, that, that the, the, it takes a long time for this stuff to kind of work its way through the system. Um, and um, a lot of the, the areas of, of uh, I, I'd say, um, a lot of the areas that we can really start to leverage are in um, computation um, and then, um, you know, the electronic side of things. And then along with that are things like autonomy um, in the robotic side. Um, there, just as an example, it's a 20-minute delay for COM to Mars. So by the time something's happened, um, you know, by the time you see it happening, it's already done. Um, so the more you can push autonomy onto systems in space, uh, the, the more you can do. When we look at things like doing uh, construction on the moon, um, we'll want to have uh, a vast array of robots doing uh, construction, but you can't have uh, a person managing every robot. Um, but you can, but it, it becomes pretty onerous. So if you can start to have deployment of, of autonomous systems um, that are doing doing tasks and then you have that modularity um, and you have powerful electronics that you know the chip makers are, are actually um, developing new products for space which is exciting and then companies like ours can leverage those and and really build out products that are, are powerful so those are areas where I really think there's going to be kind of a transformation and I see it as a, as a cooperation, a cooperative model between robots and humans, especially on places like the moon, um, where you can't be, you can't have a human presence all the time um, doing, doing work and it really, you can, you can put the burden of doing kind of the heavy lifting on the robot and then have the uh, astronaut up there to, to make the decisions, really using the strengths of each one. Use the decision-making strength of the astronaut and use the, uh, you know, the, the dull, dirty, dangerous um, capability of a robot to be out there and doing that work. So that's kind of what I, I hope for. Fantastic. Um, did this, you know, we were gonna kind of conclude Q&A now, but did this bring up any other comments that you wanna share or, you know, is there a way that our community can help support you? I think, I think we're always looking for, uh, um, you know, new ideas and, and, you know, we're obviously, one thing we're, we're always in need of is, uh, is great roboticists and, and uh, uh, robotic software engineers. Um, so if there are any of those people listening, you know, contact me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, this is kind of a, a, a new, a new kind of age of, of being able to do this stuff and, and I'm excited um, that uh, maybe we'll get to go play on the moon soon. Um, and uh, I'm really hopeful for that. And I hope everyone watches the, uh, the launch coming up here in um, end of July. So uh, anyway, thank you. Fantastic. So he is hiring. We did get that as a question. For those of you, you know, reach out to him, check their website. Do you have your jobs listed on your website as well? Yeah, sometimes. It, it sometimes lags. Sometimes. So if, uh, okay. Uh, you know. Okay, great. Um, so reach out to him, his website and his information is there. I am gonna steal this back for a minute. Thank you so much, Chris. This was fascinating. Our people on the chat and in the questions, there were so many more questions that we couldn't get to. Will you be able to stick around with us for a little bit for open networking? Sure. Okay, fantastic. I'm gonna steal it back, sharing for one second. Um, Although you guys are seeing my face right now, I also want to do a shout out to our Friday Coffee Meetup co-organizers. There are actually many of us um, and they do a tremendous amount of work to put this together each week. So I just want to say thank you to them. They do everything from 
you know, running the YouTube and podcast channel to getting us speakers to coordinating and organizing. So we are very grateful for them. Next week, we are going to be doing open networking with Alec and myself, and we will be looking forward to seeing you there um, to get to know some of the other people online. And with that, I am going to open it up for open networking. If you do want to stay on and have a conversation with your fellow attendees and Chris, go ahead and stay on and we will move you over to the panelist section. So thank you so much, Chris. We wish Motive Space Systems amazing things ahead. And we were really grateful to have you come and speak with us today. Thank you, thank you very much. It was fun.